Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Pave the Way Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Helbeck. Today with the creative finance king, Eddie Speed, out of uh, DFW, right? That's correct. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Nice to, nice to talk to you, Eddie. I'm really looking forward to this show where we're going to get into the whole creative finance side of the real estate investing business that is an area that is uh, it's talked about quite a bit, but not a lot of people really know how to actually do these deals. And uh, it's, a, it's a side of the business that's very, uh, very attractive to most people if they really knew how to do it. So that's why we brought you on the show today. So Thank before you. we get into that, Eddie, can you just kind of share with the listeners a little bit about your background and how you got uh, you know, into the business and what kind of steered you towards the more creative side of, uh, you know, the creative finance business, really using notes. Well, um, I started doing this in 1980. I was a young guy. I was uh, 20 years old. I'm an old guy now, but I was a young guy then. And uh, I was introduced into the seller finance note buying business. So it was kind of a crazy market. Interest rates were like 20%. People created seller financing because conventional mortgages weren't affordable because of the interest rate. And so that's kind of what led me to the business. Um, and, you know, probably eight or 10 years into it, uh, then I started dealing more and more with real estate investors. Um, you know, I, the guy that founded Homevestors, Ken D'Angelo, was a customer of mine in the late 80s. And then later when he founded Homevestors, he says, okay, Eddie, I want you to set up a system where our franchisees can create notes, right? So I've been doing some form of helping real estate investors create seller financing for a long time, you know, 30, 30 plus years. And, uh, <laughs> and so, I, you know, I, I, I'm always looking for a void. We still buy notes. We have a note buying business. We own, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 assets on any given day. So we're in the business. We're teaching somebody a product that we really know and understand well. But I've always had a niche for helping real estate investors to find, I, I've always tried to focus on finding a void and how could I help you do something that could really increase your production? Absolutely. So, so yeah. you've been doing this for a while. I certainly was not born in the 80s. So you've been <laughs> you deep into the business when I was born. So you got a ton of experience to share with everybody. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell with the, the beard. I look a little older, but not really. So really, you know, obviously you've been in a while. So this is, I guess, what really kind of shifted you towards this side of the business? Because I think a lot of people, they get into this business. They're very attractive to the whole fix and flip, the wholesales, yeah. you know, the, the development stuff. What made you kind of really drift into this area, which is a much more you know, exciting area? I think it's, it's, it's really, like I said in the beginning of the show, people are really interested in this because they hear it a lot, but they don't really do it. You know, they, they know of it, but they don't know really how to do it. So what got you kind of to this area of the business? Well, I mean, I, I've always bought properties using creative financing. I mean, I, my wife and I bought our first house in 1983 with creative financing. Right. I bought commercial. I bought ranches. I bought houses. I've done all kinds of things with creative financing over the years. I just never saw it as a thing. Right. To go. And so you and I have a number of mutual friends that are in real high end masterminds. Right. I've been in one high end mastermind for like eight years. You got to buy 100 houses to even be in that mastermind. Right. Yeah. So I'm around these guys all the time. Like you and I know Brad. Right. I mean, it's like. You know, and so I'm around these guys all the time. And, and a couple of years ago, I started hearing this common theme, which was the shrinkage of the market. You know, oh, yeah. in the last two years, a wholesaler doesn't say his business is going like this. He says his whole bill sale business is going like this. And some of them are going like this. They're going <laughs> the wrong, they're not going the right direction. And it's pretty simple. It's just, it's supply and demand, right? the seller is really tight in what they're willing to sell for because they have so many people banging at their door to buy their property. And the guy who's buying from the wholesaler, which is what I call the HGTV buyer, right? Um, they're not paying exactly the same margins they were paying, right? They're paying less. So the conversions are down and the profit is down and, and so I was just sitting around, you know, this group of some of these guys that, you know, and we were just all sitting around there one night and I said, I said, what you guys ought to do is 
learn to buy on wholesale terms and quit fretting about wholesale price. And they're like, what? And I'm like, dude, you can pay anything for a piece of property. It matter, matters on when you pay it. Right? I said, you're always just looking at paying cash and I can tell you all kind of creative ways that we've bought properties and we pay with tomorrow's dollars. And so that's what got me started. And they, and really as an encouragement to real high active real estate investors, I took note school in a different direction. I mean, I knew this and I would have fun and teach this along the way, but I never made it, like as I said, I never made it a whole focused area of our business. And now in the last two years, it's become, you know, the biggest growth area that we teach. Interesting. So you just said a really interesting term wholesale terms, not wholesale price. And like you said, right, you know, to kind of piggyback, you know, the market is definitely much more competitive today than it was four years ago, especially in these hyper competitive, like I, I'm in San Diego, which is probably the most competitive, one of the most competitive markets in the country. There's not a shortage of sellers getting solicitations, like you said, of, of you know, investors wanting to buy. So, it's, you know, there's, there's too much demand and not enough supply, which is definitely a real issue. We know some people and it's just that that market is is getting tough. So, you know, obviously you introduced the alternative. So what, what would a wholesale terms mean? I think a lot of people are like, what, what is this? This is, they're, they're very interested, but what does that exactly mean from like a deal perspective when you're trying to buy a house off a seller? All right. Well, so, so think of it in terms of, let's just use the simplest form. Okay. Now I know we don't have a PowerPoint slide deck or whatever, but this is a flat line. Everybody got that? Yeah. That represents, that flat line represents a stream of payments over time. Does that make sense? Yes. So somebody wants 80,000 cash today. What if I could pay him 100,000 over time? You're paying what if I could pay more for a buyer's equity, the equity they wanted, not the wholesale price you want, but I could pay for their equity over time. Interesting. So you'd so, be paying- So it'd be pretty simple, right? Just, just yeah. easy math. The guy wants 80,000 today. What if you could pay him 5,000 a year for 20 years? Interesting. Right? Interesting. Even if you put some interest on it, you're paying with tomorrow's dollars. And if you structured it right, you could turn around and sell it on a wrap note and you would get a down payment and payments from a customer way bigger than you're paying the guy you bought the house from. And you would have the money to pay him for his payment from the money you're receiving. Interesting. Okay. No, I think people are starting to get an understanding of that. So instead of offering that money today, 80 K cash, what if we got you more money, but instead of getting the, you know, the money now you're going to be getting that over a period of time, which is what you're probably going to go into next is really how you can get creative and make these profitable transactions where you can get paid now in the middle and then later. Right. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, here's what I found. What I have found is that one in 20 customers will take the cash today. Yeah, that's about right. Okay. All right. I mean, I hang out with a bunch of guys that buy north of two or 300 hours a year. So they're the ones that give me their stats. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. somebody says, well, that's not my stats. Well, that's cool. And I understand that, but I can tell you the biggest operators in the business, that one out of 20 rule is pretty close. Absolutely. That means you, that means you're successful 5% of the time, <laughs> mm -hmm. which also means that you're unsuccessful a lot more, right? 95%. 95. So here's the deal. Think about your customers, Greg. Think about what you've experienced. And I'm certain you are an excellent psychologist at the kitchen table, right? I'm yep. certain you are very good at it, right? But you made a proposition to them that no, good, no matter how good a talker you are, if they were hung up on price because they don't need the money, or they were hung up on the price because it didn't solve a problem for them. It didn't solve the problem they had to solve. You can talk as good as you want to talk. They're not going to convert, right? You're good at getting the people to convert that are willing to convert. Yes. But there's a whole demographic out there that says, I won't or can't accept your price, right? And so the deal is they are hung up on what the price is on the closing statement. Yes. Okay, well, that's no problem, dude. 
trust me, we can think up ridiculous terms. We, the terms that we get are not what a bank or a mortgage company would give us, right? The, we can think up plenty of creative terms that are, that are paying with tomorrow's dollars and paying them back in such a way that the advantage is that they gave us a wholesale price within how they structured the financing, not taking all the cash up front and they just discounted their property. So it's wholesale terms, not wholesale price. Well, that makes sense. Okay. Wholesale, that's the first takeaway for, for the listeners listening to this is, is besides thinking about wholesale price, look at wholesale terms. So you said something earlier too that I want to just make sure we cover so everyone really knows where we're getting before we share like an example on how this would actually look. You said a wraparound mortgage. You know, I'm sure you and I both know what that is. Successful investors know what that is. If, if someone is not familiar with that, say they're brand new or they've never even ventured into this area of real estate, what is a wraparound mortgage? Just so everyone can understand the lingo we're going to use when we get more into the weeds. All right. I'm, I'm going to start out with another example, if I can, for just a moment. Sure. Okay. Because sure. I think everybody can totally resonate with this. You ever hear of anybody uh, doing a lease on a property that they're going to turn around and sublease it on a Airbnb? Oh yeah, totally. Okay. That's a, that's a sandwich lease, right? Yep. All right. So you have a lease payment that you owe the, the owner of the house. Yeah. When you write the provisions in the lease that says you can release it Airbnb and rent it every night, right? Yeah. That's yeah. a wrap. That's a wrap. Okay. So all I'm doing is I'm taking the underlying mortgage and then I'm reselling it and offering financing when I sell it they make a payment to me and I make my payment that I owe to the other underlying lender. It's a wrap okay. note, right? So they're not paying the, my mortgage directly, they're paying me or they're paying a servicing company. And then that servicing company properly pays the underlying mortgage holder. We disclose to them, we tell them it's a wrap. Um, we have found that there's an excessive amount of people in the market, including in San Diego, or any other market in the world that are what we call penalty box buyers, right? <laughs> they're, they're great people. They don't have bad credit. They're not, ba they're not Mr. Sad Story. It's not that. They are, they're, they, they're here legally, but they have a green card, right? They're here, uh, they're, they're self-employed. Maybe they're recently divorced. Maybe they have, maybe they work for Google and they have a two year employment contract and the mortgage lender says how you got to have a five year, you know, employment contract if we're going to make you a loan. Right. So there's all these weird reasons that people don't qualify for a conventional loan. And, uh, and that's in working class, middle class and upper class. Right. So the bottom line is this, we show you how to structure loans with either taking over the, the seller's original financing, right? Or then having a hybrid where they have some uh, mortgage against it and then we have the seller carry some, a mortgage or maybe they just own it all free and clear. It could be all the above, right? Mm -hmm. But what we really show you is how to create an abnormally low payment that you owe uh, for the house sure. and then how to go sell the house at a payment that's obviously higher than what you collect. Plus, when you sell it, you get a down payment. So you make transactional income because you bought it and so, bought and sold the house and you resold it to somebody that made a, a down payment to you. That's essentially the same money as- Like a wholesale fee, basically. Flip money, yeah. yeah. But, boom, 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 cash flow for 20 years. Interesting, because you're not the landlord in that situation, you're the bank. You got basically. It. So I just want to make sure that everyone really gets this because we're spitting a lot out of people, which is good. So we can either buy that house off the seller subject to, which is when you assume the loan and you start making the payments, maybe you catch up some arrears. That's very common in a foreclosure situation. The second option that you shared was maybe the seller has some equity, but it's not free and clear. And we do take the wrap around with them. And then they, they pretty much, you know, agree to sell us on the wrap. And then we make them the payment, which then they pay the bank. And then we go seller finance it to another, you know, obviously a buyer, the penalty box buyer, as he shared. Um, or the third option is just an owner finance with the seller. And then we turn around and owner finance it to someone else. And we're in the middle. 
We're not the bank or sorry, we're not the, the landlord. We're not dealing with toilets. We're not dealing with, you know, Hey, this is broken, you know, fire. It's, it's, we're strictly becoming the bank, right? We're not dealing with any property. Obviously issues. if you got them to carry soft terms for you, right? Terms that a bank or a mortgage company wouldn't carry, right? Yeah. Then obviously you could rent it. And people that love having rental portfolios, it's great. I'm just going to show you how to get cheaper money than the bank would ever give you. Yeah. Or, or, qual or, you know, how do you get a $50 million a line of credit to buy properties with no personal guarantee and no qualifications? It's, how, it's what I teach you how to do, right? But we are in a market that is maybe not the perfect timing to go add rentals to your portfolio right? Yeah. This isn't 2012, right? So a lot of guys that we teach after they analyze it a little bit, they draw a conclusion. I would be smarter to be the lender than smarter to be the landlord because there, there may be a reset, not going the right direction in the market. You can draw your own conclusions about that. I'm not, I'm not here to give you, you know, terrible news today about the real estate market, but I think most people think we are closer to the the uh, fourth quarter than we are the uh, end of the fourth quarter than we are the, oh, yeah. the beginning of the second quarter, right? Of the football I game. Uh, I think that's very true. That's interesting. So that's the key there is you're, you're not, you're, you're simply, it seems to me like really Eddie, that the key on this is number one, well, two things. Number one, finding someone who's going to sell their property on wholesale terms, a reasonable seller, right? And it might not be, I'm going to jump off a cliff if I don't sell my house at 50 cents on the dollar. Someone who's open to, Maybe like you said, getting the higher price, but with terms that make more sense for you, which is an area, like you said, that not a lot of investors are really are, are, are marketing to. They're not thinking that way. They're like, oh, I need to get this house at you know, 70 cents on the dollar. You know, and that's, that's where all the, the saturation is. The second well, thing, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, I mean, just on, on that thought process, don't stop wholesaling your deals, right? Just simply dig in your garbage can and take the deals that you're not closing and go rework them. Yeah. Interesting. No, and that's true too, especially for people who have a team of acquisition agents, you know, they got salespeople and they get paid on commission. So, you know, the more of these they can dig up, the, the better it's going to be for them when they, you know, when they go to, you know, make a commission on their sales. So the second thing I was going to say was when it comes to the, I guess this, the selling part of this really transaction or really long-term transaction, it's, we need to find buyers that are the penalty box buyers who, who, like you said, might not be bad people, but some reason or another, it's challenging for them to get traditional financing. Therefore, they would be more receptive to your terms because the bank's terms aren't going to work for them. So what are you doing in terms of an interest? Like, let's kind of go into a little bit about the interest rate on some of these things, maybe with the, with the seller first and then with that buyer. And then we'll kind of, we'll, we'll kind of pack it all up with it with a case study uh, so we can really kind of hit this on the head. And then, uh, you know, share with people some information to get in touch with you if they want to attend some trainings and really how to dive deep into this. Great question. What is, what, what kind of interest rate will the penalty yeah. box buyer pay? What can they afford and what's acceptable to them? And it's all relevant to price band. Mm. So the penalty box buyer that's buying a $500,000 or a house is not going to pay 9% interest. No. Now the penalty box buyer that's buying a hundred and twenty thousand dollar house in Texas, or a two hundred thousand dollar house in California, will absolutely pay nine percent interest. Right. So, so because they're more of a blue collar level buyer, and you know they're still paying close to what rent is, and yeah. they have home ownership. And instead of being a tenant for twenty years, they own a house in twenty years. So it's all relative, there's relative math to that conversation, but we know and teach this and help guys with it all the time. And so we, we, we've learned that. So we teach kind of a scale of the higher price man is gonna have a little lower interest rate. Usually today we have found out about 7% is that number because that is about what the interest rate is for them to go get what the mortgage industry calls a non-QM loan. What's QM right? mean? Um, it, so it's, it's basically, these are, these are loans that where their debt to income ratio, in other words, a Fannie Mae loan is a QM loan. A, a FHA loan is a QM loan. 
but there's it's kind of non QM is kind of the subprime of the mortgage industry today. Going back to the old 2008 yeah, conversation, yeah. right? Okay. So, so uh, that's about where that rate is sometimes. But I but I will sometimes teach somebody how to structure it where their underlying mortgage interest rate is two percent. So if you're borrowing money at two and you're relending it at six, you're good. You're right? good to go. <laughs> it, so you don't even necessarily have to go to the top of what's possible in some cases. So, um, and, and once again, that depends on the situation. Here's what I've learned. There's 5% probably, Greg, of the real estate investors in America that say, oh yeah, 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 I buy on terms. I buy when, and make seller finance offers, creative financing, and the seller carries the terms for me, right? Probably 5% of the people in the industry say they do it, right? Here's what I've learned. There's junior high football and there's NFL football. Both of them say they play football, right? What I try to do is, is break down the process so people understand what's possible and what they're negotiating for, right? So it's not the generic you know, zero interest rate offer, which zero interest will work, but it'll work maybe 20% of the time where the seller will carry all the financing for you and they're not, they'll do it at no interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool when it happens, right? But when it doesn't happen, how can you get the same effect as zero interest, right, on your deal? And I teach people techniques to do it. And, and you can imagine the only way you can do this is take case studies show a house, break it down, show the numbers, show how you bought it, show how you sold it. And then everybody goes, oh, okay, I can see it. Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, you can't, you can't like draw, draw the imagination in midair, right? You got to kind of like unpack how it works. And that's yeah. obviously why we train people. Yeah, that's interesting. That makes a lot of sense. So here's a, one more follow-up question for you that I bet you a lot of the listeners are thinking about now, and then we'll get into this case study. So Eddie, what are we doing? So obviously we know the terms with the penalty box buyer are long, long term. That's a long term note with them. However, when it comes to that, that first, you know, seller we're dealing with, because we're essentially in between buyers and sellers doing this, making profits. Yeah. What would you say, uh, how long are those terms with that seller? Because, because there's a lot of situations that can happen. Are we doing five to 10 year terms? So let's say we have a five to 10 year term with a seller and we got a 20 year with the buyer. That means we're going to have to either refi or pay. Like, what do you do in that situation? And because that's probably something that I'm sure a lot of your students or people that reach out to you, they're like, hey, what, what do I do here? So what happens in there? Just so, you know, listeners can be like, oh, okay, that's, that's what you do. Well, you can imagine the idea of creative financing spider webs into oh. all kind of possibilities, right? Yeah, totally. So, so let me speak in terms of patterns patterns instead of instead of instead of absolutes because there's always exceptions to any rule correct but here's what i have learned right when i teach somebody how to negotiate this i teach them to negotiate a longer term than they or the seller would have originally thought so I teach them some talk off strategies so that you're a five year zero interest rate note is really not that good a deal. The difference between zero interest and 5% interest on a five year loan is really not that amazingly different. Okay. But let me just tell you something. The difference between a 6% loan and a 2% loan for 20 years is money. And so term is more important than rate. Most guys you've heard talk about buying on terms always focus on zero interest. And I'm not saying it isn't good. And I have plenty of examples where I've helped people into carving those deals up. But the truth of the matter is you asked really a very smart question, which is how do you match the terms? How do you get the seller to carry a term that you need the buyer your buyer that, that can pay you over 30, 25 years, well, you need 25 years on the front side. And so we show examples of how to structure different things to get there, right? And, and sometimes, sometimes there becomes a compromise where you gotta go put a balloon on it, right? You gotta go put a 10 year balloon on it and the guy that's paying you has to do a 10 year balloon. That sometimes happens. 
I've got an excellent case study of a guy up there north of you um, that's, um, that's just south of Oakdale. He buys 180 houses a year. Seth, you may know him. Oh, yeah, 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 I know Seth. And so I coach him, good guy, and he's got, he's got, term, he's got different deals that we've structured in different ways. Uh, and he's got some that we did have to put a balloon on it in 10 years. But the point is, I have learned that if you know what you're negotiating for, you become a lot more effective at how you position it so you can get what you're looking for. What I've learned is most real estate investors that are trying to do creative financing, in all honesty, they don't know really what they're negotiating for. So I teach them a process of this is the best deal. This is what you're looking for. This is what a best terms deal looks like. And then all of a sudden they become a lot more effective at negotiating it because now they know they're not, their ear changes into what they're looking for or how they say things, right? That's so, interesting, yeah. No, that's so awesome. this seller, you know, so our friend Seth, um, this is completely opposite. Right. This is not about somebody that had a bunch of equity. This is somebody that had no equity. So it's a property in Modesto. Okay. Now, uh, and this, and I know people say, hey, Modesto was like, trust me, this is a nice house. It's a very nice house. Right. Nice neighborhood. It's safe. This lady was in the military. She had military clearance, security clearance. And so then she finally bought a house, and all of a sudden the military moves her. She gets transferred. Now listen, she has security clearance. You understand what that means? She has a foreclosure on her credit. What happens to her security clearance? You got it. It's a problem, right? A major problem. Realtors, she has no equity. So she's got like a 4% mortgage, a VA loan. She, she's got essentially not much equity, less than 10%. And the realtors couldn't help her. She couldn't rent it. It wouldn't cash flow. And so he comes in there and does a sub two wrap. So he takes over her mortgage subject to. Okay. He sells it. He gets, he gets 20,000 down from a new buyer, a penalty box buyer. And he carries the financing for them at like six and a half percent interest. Well, let me just tell you something. Six and a half percent is way better than them just paying rent. Right. Yeah, they didn't, okay. they paid retail, maybe top of retail, but they didn't overpay for it. So there was about 20,000 margin between what she owed and this. But here's the deal. He gets a check for $400 a month. He makes 20,000 a day on a deal that a wholesaler wouldn't even write out and look at. Yeah. He gets a check for about $400 a month for the next 28 years. Would you do that deal? You get the best of both worlds there, Eddie. Exactly. You got so, cash flow and cash. Yeah. So, so this is, this is an example of, of what we're trying to teach guys to do is like, don't stop wholesaling, you know, go, go do every wholesale deal you can do, you know, get as many closings as you can over here in this bucket. Well, what about this bucket? What about this bucket over here? That's huge. That are the deals that aren't closing. Well, we teach them how to filter through there and find possibles and then structure deals. No, that's, that's interesting. And it's, it's funny you're saying all this because the thing you shared earlier is that there's three sellers you can do this with. You could do it with a distressed seller with the sub two, which you just shared. We can do it with sellers who have some equity, right? And they can do the wraparound, which we explained already. So if you don't know what that is, re-listen to this and you'll find out. Or we could do it with people who own their house free and clear who might not need to sell their house right now for cash, but they're willing to, let's say it was a landlord. They didn't want to be the landlord, but they want the cash flow. We can, it's as long as we can find a little bit of a delta between what the interest rates are going to be and what the terms are going to be, you know, we can, and we make sure we're focusing on those penalty box buyers. You know, we can make these deals work. And that's, uh, it's interesting because Brad called me one day and he's like, he's like, dude, this guy, Eddie, he's talking about these creative finance deals. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And he explained all this to me. And I was like, what? Like, that's interesting. And then he's like, you got to get him on the show. You know, anyway, so now we're here talking, but um, this is something. And why do you think Eddie, this is not like, obviously this is a little more, you have to really know what you're doing when it comes to this. That's why you got the trainings. But why do you think a lot of investors aren't really talking? Like, why is this not like the, the new wholesaling? You know, why aren't people being like, Oh yeah, this subject to wraps, like this is not really common or popular. And if it's, 
from a surface level, I mean, this level, this is a better strategy. You're going to make cash now and cash flow now, and you don't have to be the bank. I mean, why aren't people jumping on this like white on rice? Well, I, you know, I think I'm uniquely prepared for this. Uh, I've, I've been doing it 40 years. I've probably seen three or 400,000 seller finance notes. We price north of 2,500 mom and pop seller finance notes a year right now today. So we are in an incredible spot where we see a lot of these notes and we understand from a seller's perspective what's okay with them. Yeah. Right? A real estate investor has a disadvantage because he's trying to reason what he thinks is reasonable to them, but he does he's never seen enough of this to know, hey, there's a there's a there's a pattern to this, there's a thread to this, right? And so um you know, I'm not the only guy that talks about it. Um I have I think there's a lot of people like Seth or Brad that would say note school and Eddie Speed's guys teach this at a significantly different level, right? Sure. We should, of course we should. You, you couldn't find anybody with more experience on this subject than us, right? My executive team's bought over $3 billion in seller finance notes. I mean, that's pretty savvy on the subject, right? Yeah. So, um, so we just we just saw it as a market niche. I was around all of these mutual friends of ours uh, for for several years, and uh, I didn't try to teach this to them because they didn't need it, right? They didn't they their their conversions were good enough. They were getting enough juice out of the lemon. They weren't forced to go rechange their game, right? Now the problem is they're looking at their business and their cost of marketing has gone up. Huge, yeah. And, and, and their margin per transaction has gone down. And, and the combination of that is they're like, you know, I'm not getting all the juice out of the lemon, so to speak. Yeah. And, and, and so now all of a sudden, you know, I said, well, you know, I'm willing to really take this on. And I have, I mean, I've taken significant ownership of this. Like I have spent, thousands of hours studying every possibility and not just studying it, but studying it in a way that I could teach it where people could do it. You know, the one fear that somebody has today, let's be fair about it. They are convinced I can do it. That's not the issue, right? They're not, they're, they're not convinced the guys made a living doing this for 40 years. Can't do it. The issue is they're fearful. They can't do it. Yes. Okay. And so I have taken that on head on and say, we can teach you how to do this. We may not make you an NFL star in a, in, in a weekend class, right? We can make you an NFL star, but we can show you things that you can go do and add this to your business right now and close deals that clearly you're passing up. That last week you passed on and this week you could close. That is absolutely something I can say with confidence. Yeah. And not only are you, I, I totally agree with that. And not only are they closing deals that they might not have closed, but now, you know, they're, they're building cash flow. They're building income like that they would it's a creating income out of thin air like what does the return on your marketing look like there what is your overall profitability of a company like you're, there's so many other ways when you can do these deals it's like you're just it's almost like you're uh, trying to color in a big picture and you don't have that the right color but when you can color it in and you have the right color it's gonna you're gonna it's gonna make a lot more sense you know you have another tool in your tool belt so eddie before we go here and we share some content information can we just go through one more basic case study Sure. Um, we did the sub two one. Let's go through one more case study. Then we'll wrap this up and uh, we'll, we'll end on that note. Cause I think this is a, there's been a very um, action packed, you know, a lot of information in a short period of time. So let's, let's wrap this all up with a case study. I'll let you pick the situation. We'll walk through it and then we'll, we'll wrap the show up. Okay. So the, one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to give your listeners a book that I've just written. Oh, about very good. This. And, and so we'll, we're going to give them a landing page with, with the book. And then I'm going to automatically put them in a little workshop. And we're just, in that workshop, we're going to do case studies and we're going to do some of this. So I'm going to do a case. I'm going to 
I, I plan to do this in the workshop I offer for your guys because this is another strategy. How many times, Greg, have you been 20% away from making a deal? I, Countless? Yeah, countless. Okay, so I have a student who's in a hot market called Seattle. Oh. Okay, so here's the setup. He's, he's trying to buy a duplex and live in one side and rent the other, okay? The seller, the seller is stuck on price and they're stuck on the fact that yes, we will owner finance you, but we want 5% interest. Okay, so, so they're willing to say, we want this price, which was 325,000, and we want 5% interest. We're not negotiable on the price, and we want 5% interest, and we're not negotiable on that. How much money down do they want? Well, and my guy that's buying only wants to pay 5,000 down. Okay. okay. So if you run the math, just back into what budgets, the payment's too high. Yeah. Oh yeah. He wants the tenant to essentially pay his mortgage payment. Yeah. Okay. So on the surface, most savvy guys that think they understand buying on terms, they would say, well, just get the seller to carry a lower payment or lower, lower rate. He says, I've already been there with them 10 times. They're not doing it. So the simple stuff had already been tried. Time I got a hold of the deal. It was all the, the normal stuff. The, you know, the, 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 the thinking through it clearly and stuff had already been done. And so I said, okay, what, how much could you finance? How much could you finance and make your payment what it needs to be? Well, I could finance 260,000. I said, how much do you need to finance? He said, 320. Okay. I said, well, you're there. He goes, what? I said, you're there. I said, get them to carry 260,000 at 5% interest and that makes your payment what you need it to be. He said, true. I said, so you're there. I'm, I'm teasing with him, of course, right? He said, how am I there? I'm 60,000 short. I said, write an air note. Now I'm Southern, right? Air is in A-I-R. Air note, yeah. An air note. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, write it at zero interest zero payment due in 15 years. Interesting. And he said, but they're insistent on 5% interest. I said, Kevin, you need to understand that the primary mortgage they're carrying for you, you're giving them exactly what they said they wanted and what you are willing to agree to. You just need help on a little of it. He lost his nerve and he only got him, he only asked for 10 years, but they never stuttered. So let me ask you, how many times have you been that close to making a deal and you could have written a little piece of financing on top of it that the closing statement would have said what they wanted it to say? Interesting. Wow. That's, that's like the razor's edge there, right? That, that really, uh, <laughs> that like it's make it or make it or break it. So they did the air note. So basically they deferred the last $40,000 for 15 years down the line, right? Yeah. And they got their original financing. And, and people went, worry about it. Well, how am I going to pay it? And we, in, in a longer case study, we'll model it out and show you different yeah. ways you can do it. But the bottom line is, look, the dude bought a duplex in Seattle for 5,000 down and the tenant makes his mortgage payment. Is that good? Could you live with that? <laughs> yeah. That's an awesome case study. Oh my goodness. That, that's like, you know, the more you know, the more, I think this is a strategy where when you really understand how to do it and you have that confidence from the knowledge, then you can go out and put this to action in the street and you're like, oh, I know exactly what to do. I've done this, I've done that, I've training. I think once people really understand that, they're much more open to, to trying this. Because a lot of people, you know, like as we started in the beginning there, you know, only 5% of people are really doing this. Like most real estate investors, like I said, they've heard this thrown around, but they're like, they don't know creative finance from, from, from a you know, from anything. They're just like, whatever. So Eddie, this has been a really cool podcast. I've personally learned a lot. This has been fun. What would be the best way? So we have a link for, for people who are interested. Well, I have that link in the, um, in the show notes. What is that link going to take them to? And then after we go over that link, what would be the best way for them to get in touch with you if they had any other questions or your company? Sure. So this link does go to our company and it's noteschool.com 
forward slash velocity. Yep. Okay. Obviously. And, uh, and, and what we're going to do, I've just finished a book. I mean, literally Greg, like your, your guys are the guys that are getting the, I've just finished this. Uh, but it's called, it's a whole new ball game with creative financing and it's written around the concept of the movie Moneyball. Oh, okay. Because it's the same thing, right? Moneyball was about people who've been playing baseball for years and Billy Bean comes in, you know, manager of the Oakland A's and takes a team that's the second lowest team pay, paid team in baseball and wins a World Series because he is studying what the numbers are telling him to do. And so I watching that movie late one night thinking about what I'm teaching all these hot shot real estate investors. I realized that's what I'm doing. I'm doing money ball for real estate. I love it. And here's the thing. So this book's a good read. It's not terribly long. It's less than 50 pages, but it, it is, it's a good precursor. It's kind of gets you mentally prepared for uh, the next step. And the next step would be just, you know, having a workshop and just online and just showing people some stuff. Now this isn't, all the training somebody would ever want to do, but it's a good framework. And I've, I've mentioned a couple of these people today that will take these and lay these out, these concepts out in a way that people can see it. And, uh, and you know, and as I told you earlier, I mean, we do have three day classes. Uh, I, I'm confident in saying that the top 200 real estate investor of the top 500 real estate investors in the business, 200 of them will be at these classes in the next 12 months. I've already probably had 50 or 60 there in the past 90 days. Brad, Brad being one of them, right? Yeah. They called you after he came back from a class. Yes. Yeah. So the answer is that I realize the more that I can show people examples, the more this resonates with them. The reason that somebody takes action and does this initially is pretty simple. How full is your trash can of deals not closing? If it's not full, then you shouldn't make any changes. But if it's full, this is an alternative that really will work. Absolutely. So if they, once again, if they wanted to get that book, Eddie, what would be the, is there a, a direct link or is that note school velocity to take them to the book? Yep. That's it. I'm giving them, I'm giving them your link here. And uh, that is noteschool.com forward slash. Everybody knows that's the one that points towards the front of the word, right? It doesn't really matter. Both of them work, but velocity. Awesome. And uh, once they do that and go get that link, then uh, then we're going to give you some solid, solid stuff. It's, it's just our gift to you guys. And uh, we're just going to give you some solid stuff to really start realizing, okay, is this something I can see applying to my business? I, I'm certain it will be, but at least I want to give people a chance to make their own independent evaluation. Absolutely. Well, we'll have that link in the show notes. And uh, Eddie, I'm sure a lot of the, all the listeners are like blown away after this. They're like, oh my goodness, this is something that maybe, like I said, they heard of, but they didn't, ne they've never heard a conversation like you and I, you know, kind of chatting about how this actually looks. And obviously that book, we'll get to get them into more detail and the trainings will do the same. So Eddie, thank you so much for your time today. That was uh, a ton of fun and uh, I'm sure some people will be reaching out. Great. Good to talk to you. Awesome. See you.